Gentleman from Indiana. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I come from Indianapolis, Indiana, probably the state that has more gambling casinos than any other state in the United States. I have a question in terms of consistency. The race, the Der Kentucky Derby held in Louisville, Kentucky, you could bet on it from anywhere in Indiana by computer. Go up and do that. Question, what is the difference between internet gambling and being able to gamble on the horses? Could one of you refined gentlemen answer that question for me, please? You're not going to answer? Hi, I'm, I'm not sure there is a difference. I'm not either. That's why I'm confused. I think we all are. Yeah. Uh, Madam Congresswoman. Um, How do you know what party I'm with? You're on that side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it was easier for me. Oh, thank, okay. Thank I'm sorry, you. madam. But, no problem. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I know I have heard uh, objection to this for family, pardon me, Mr. Chairman, for family reasons, because they feel like they'll gamble off their money before they bring the paycheck home to their spouses. They do that now. I mean, it doesn't require internet gambling to make some irresponsible person not accommodate his or her responsibilities first for the family. But I'm still confused on how you can bet at a racetrack. You go up, they put your numbers in by computer, give you a receipt, and in this situation, dealing with this legislation, you can do it over the internet, either by credit card or whatever kind of card you use. And I guess I, the bottom line, and I don't want to belabor the point, is why are we debating this? People gamble because they want to gamble. As long as it's consensual adults gambling, whether they're being responsible or not responsible. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could legislate responsib responsibility <laughs> among human beings of age? We can't do it. So while I think I voted for restrictions the last time that it was up, I don't, and I, I don't feel hypocritical either. I just think more time has passed, and you understand better what it is that you're trying to do. We've changed a lot of laws, reversed a lot, and I don't know what the chairman's gonna do with this one, but if he wants to repeal what we did, I'm gonna vote to repeal it, because it's just not making sense to me. But I'm not the brightest star in the galaxy either. So I have to have some help. But I've enjoyed the tax testimony, believe it or not, I've read it. And I thank you very much. I thank the gentleman for my support and I would caution the witnesses if they haven't already figured this out. It is when the gentleman from Indiana is at her most self-deprecatory that I would be very careful if I were you. <laughs> The gentleman's time's expired. I need to go to Ms. Carson, if I may. Ms. Carson? No, I'll, I'll be extremely brief. I was trying to discern whether or not on the ground in Louisiana there is sufficient know-how and manpower to rebuild a city. Reminds me of Charles Dickens' tale of two cities. Do you have people there, living there, available there, who can begin the reconstruction process of a city. And then secondly, and I don't want to cause any trouble, because that's my middle name, <laughs> FEMA. <laughs> Should FEMA be allowed to run its course? 
I realize any entity agency has its mistakes to make. But when I read where they were telling those people, they had to get out of the hotels. They apparently don't know what their mission is. In my opinion, because I'm in the abstract now, I admit that. Are you at liberty, are you apprehensive about criticizing FEMA in terms of how it's responded and what it plans to do now? If not, I'll understand it and won't regard that as being Thank you. disrespectful. We need to wind FEMA down, get them out of town, and have alternative resources deployed as quickly as possible. you need funded. legislation to do that, to Mr. Chairman? Well, I, I, I'm hopeful that working with Mr. Uh, Watt and others that we can come to some resolution, but yes, we do. Uh, we, we need to get something done pretty quickly, too. I yield back in fact deference I, to my I, other I think that Thank lady, you. Mr. Green, did Ms. Carson. Ms. Carson. I'm going to be uh, very quick because a lot of what I was going to say has already been said and I won't be redundant. I've been in Congress almost 10 years and there has never in my tenure of Congress that I've seen an individual as reverent as the Honorable Mr. David Gunn. You have individuals from both sides of the aisle who extol the virtues, the talent, the experience of a person who's got a track record that's impeccable. My concern, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, is how can somebody who has no experience, no ability, come in and fire somebody who excels in what he's doing in terms of Amtrak? Amtrak, as all of you know, came to the defense of America when we were hit during 9-11. Prior to that time, Amtrak was at work. If we had not had Amtrak, this country would have continued to stand still. The person that is head of the board, if there is such a board, I don't know how you can take two people and fire a giant like Mr. Gunn. Two of them have even been confirmed. It's really a partisan board. They're all Republicans. You have not bothered to name the Democrat members of the board. I don't know how you can have some inexperienced, some inept individuals come in and fire a person of Mr. Gunn's magnitude who has a track record that's indisputable. I'm going to close by reminding that when we had a hearing back in September, I asked Mr. David Laney what he thought about Mr. Gunn. Mr. Laney's quote verbatim was, he took Amtrak, this is Mr. Laney referring to Mr. Gunn, he took Amtrak from the day he landed on the platform and is right at the ship that was listening and about to spill over. As far as I'm concerned, David Gunn is a terrific operator. That is a quote from Mr. David Laney himself when he fired Gunn because of his resistance to the strategic initiative. I would like for the two unconfirmed board members to come before this committee, Mr. Chairman, and explain what a strategic initiative is. Even though I'm not a betting person, I can assure you they don't have the slightest idea. So I want to thank again the chairman and the ranking member for having this committee, and I personally want to give Mr. Gunn a standing ovation. I usually don't do that, especially with some Bush appointee. But you give credit where credit's due. Mr. Gunn has worked amicably, pro professionally, with both members of the aisle in Congress, both the Democrats and Republicans. That is a rare breed for the Bush administration. And I would think that given all of the trouble that the Bush administration had, all of the mess-ups of a Michael Brown, that they'd want to keep the one bright and shining star that they have, and that's Mr. David Gunn, and I applaud him. I don't apologize for him, and I hope his life does not become even more difficult because somebody from the liberal side of the aisle has given him standing ovation. I yield back, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentlelady very much. Mr. DeFazio is next. Gentleman yields back. The uh, gentleman from Indiana is Carson. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Greenspan, for being here and for your public service and, and also for the financial literacy uh, workshop that you conducted for me. It's been very beneficial uh, well, thank, to my Thank district. you very much. Grants for down payments, where we give money to people to buy homes. I noticed in your statement on page 10, you talk about the increase in the prevalence of interest-only loans and the introduction of more exotic forms of adjustable rate markets. Would you consider the giving of a grant for a down payment for a low-income family to be an exotic form of uh, support? And then also I'm concerned about the housing market because I'm the queen of uh, 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 predatory lending, and also I think Indiana still ranks highest among foreclosures. So that sort of relates to the question that I asked. But anyway, I know you've taken steps to control inflation, but there's, there's still a dearth of housing available to people with modest incomes, but I'm afraid that the availability is pricing the moderate income people out of the housing market. Thirdly, if you have time, can you comment on whether or not the oil prices that our consumers face are related to a war? It is not a political question. It is whether or not you believe that the fires and the oil fields and the drawing up of the oils has in fact got a direct correlation to the insurmountable inflation prices of oil. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You back. General Lee goes back. The uh, general lady from New York, Ms. Carson. I was expired. General lady from uh, Indiana, uh, Ms. Carson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask first and foremost that the balance of my remarks, that the majority of my remarks, be inserted in the record. Without objection. To the uh, chairman and certainly to the ranking chairman, thank you all for calling this very important hearing. I'd like to thank Mr. Powell for being here today. It has been almost seven months since Hurricane Katrina and Rita devastated our Gulf Coast. It is estimated that over 300,000 housing units have been destroyed, are damaged, killed about 1,400 people and has caused roughly $90 billion in damage. Since the storm hit, we've had hearing after hearing, yet we are very slow to move for a resolution and to get things done to help this region of the people who have been so devastatingly affected. We passed legislation with bipartisan support that would have begun the process of rebuilding and reviving the Gulf Coast, but the administration turned it down. Not only did they turn down the proposal, but they have failed to come up with an alternative plan. Representative Watt proposed another piece of legislation that would also start the rebuilding. People in this room were willing to take action while the federal government is reluctant to step up to the plate. I am not about to criticize you, Mr. Powell, for having this delay occur that has affected so many so many vulnerable people in the South. But I would hope that your leadership would lead us in the right direction so that we can expedite some relief for these poor people who are just left stranded out in the wilderness, if you will. I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. If you don't want it back, I'll keep talking. Thank you, General Lady. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Newgebauer.